<laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Oh 
Amen. 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 all these that are visiting with us today too. Thank you so much. You, you, several have asked me what happened. All I know is I woke up yesterday morning and I felt just fine. And I went and ate breakfast with Bill. And when I got through, 
about an hour later, I couldn't hardly walk. It's been hurting like the Dickens ever since. And so Bill works for a, a vet. So Bill, could you get me an appointment tomorrow morning to see that vet? I think I need it. You have a seat, and let's turn in our Bible this morning to the book of Job. The book of Job, it's in the Old Testament. Find, uh, turn to the middle and find Psalms, and then turn left, and uh, you're at Job. Job, we're going to look uh, this morning at the subject of learning to handle grief. I've never heard a sermon on that before in my life until I prepared this message. But it's something that all of us have to deal with in our life. And I think it's a very helpful subject, learning to handle grief. We're looking at the book of Job, and we're going to be looking at what happened in his life. I uh, can't read the whole book, but I'm going to read a few verses through the book of Job to remind you of the story of Job. So we begin reading in chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the land of us there lived a man whose name was Job, and this man was blameless and upright, and he feared God, and he shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, had a large number of servants, and he was the greatest man among all the people of the East. And then look at verse 13. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby. And the Sabians attacked and carried them off and they, and they put the servants to the sword. And the only one who escaped, I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said the fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants. And I'm the only one. Who's escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. And they put the servants to the sword. And I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house. When suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. And it collapsed on them and they were all dead. I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. And at this, Job got up and he tore his robe, he shaved his head, and, when, and then he fell to the ground in worship. And then in chapter 2, verse 7, it says, And so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. And then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And, and all this Job did not sin in what he said. And then in chapter 3 verse 1 it says, After this Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, May the day of my birth perish. And the night it was said, A boy is born. And then in chapter 29 you may just want to look on the screen and follow me there. In chapter 29, verse 1, it says, And Job continued his discourse. How I long for the months gone by when the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone upon my head and by his light I walked through darkness. Oh, for the days when I was in my prime, when God's intimate fellow friendship blessed my house, when the Almighty was still with me and my children were around me. And then in the last chapter, chapter 42, verse 1, it says, And then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. And in verse 10 it said, And after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. You know, the familiar words that describe the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 could also be used to describe Job. Job was a man of sorrows. Acquainted with grief. And, uh, and really that's descriptive of all of us. All of us, if we live long enough in this life, we could be called a man of sorrows. Acquainted with grief. Oftentimes we think of grief really, uh, you know, relating only to bereavement and death. And, and that is the most intense. And that's true. But anytime we care about something and lose it, we become a candidate. 
for a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And learning to handle it in a healthy way, learning how to lose is one of life's most important lessons. Oftentimes, parents want to shield their children from, from loss, and, and, um, and, and, that, and, and I understand that. But if they live very long, they will begin to understand and go through grief experiences themselves. As soon as a child's old enough to love something that can be lost, they become a candidate. For a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. I remember even as a, a young child, I grew up north of Tyler, and uh, my best friend's name was Kenny Howard, and, and he was the pastor's son, and, and we learned to ride bicycles together, and he was my closest friend, but, and our families were close, but I remember when my mama told me that, that he, his daddy, who was our pastor, was called to another church down at Port Arthur, and that they would be moving away. I can still remember as a five-year-old boy standing there beside the car as we told the Howards goodbye, and they moved off, and, and I became a candidate for Minnesota's as my best friend moved away. I, I grew up with horses, and, and I had several horses growing up, but my favorite was a pony named Rebel, and I loved him, I broke him, I trained him, and... I remember one summer when I was 11 years old, Daddy called me and I was still in bed and said, Royce, uh, Rebel got out and, and uh, you, uh, you need to get him back inside the pasture. And I remember walking down there beside the, the road there and there was Rebel, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence and he thought so and I got him and I put him back in the pasture and went and got my hammer and my staples and I started down the fence there trying to find the hole where he got out and I, I found a hole and... Uh, I, I fixed the fence there, and I was 11 years old. I went back home. I didn't check the rest of the fence. The next morning, Daddy called and said, Royce, Rebel got out again, and he was hit by a truck. And I remember even as an 11-year-old boy standing there and looking up the highway and seeing old Rebel laying there beside the road. And even as a child, became a candidate for a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And the truth is, none of us can avoid the trauma of loss if we love it even a little bit. And the patterns we develop early in our life affect how we react when trauma and bereavement comes. Nobody sows and reaps the same day. When I was a young pastor, I was in seminary in Fort Worth. I was called, my wife and I were called to pastor in Athens, Texas. And we went there to pastor at West Athens Baptist Church. And one Wednesday night in prayer meeting, we were calling for prayer requests. And one of my teenage girls stood up and, and asked us to pray for her brother. He had been in a, a, a bad car wreck in Atlanta, Georgia, and he was in a coma. We prayed for their family for several months, and then they actually moved him because of his coma. They moved him back to our little county hospital there, Henderson County Hospital in Athens. And I went there to the hospital and, and visited him often. I met his wife. Judy was just, I think, 19 years old. She had two girls, two children already, and was pregnant with a third. It was a, a tragic situation as he laid there in the coma. After being there several months, uh, we got to know Judy. Our church ministered to her. Judy came and gave her heart to the Lord, and, and I baptized her. Uh, but her mother came from Atlanta to visit her and, uh, and convinced her to, to take a day off. She had been by his side every day. And convinced her to take a couple of days off and go up to Paris, Texas, and, and visit some relatives up there. It was ironic. The day after she left, having been by his bed all these months, the day after he, she left, he died. And, and the family called me and we talked about the funeral and I said, uh, where's Judy? And they said, we don't know where she is. She went up to visit some family up in Paris. And, and I, I said, well, we got to get a hold of her. And they had no clue. And so I called the sheriff and, up there in the county and got a hold of him. And we tracked her down. I got her on the phone and I said, Judy, your, your husband's passed away and the funeral is going to be in, in two days. And she told me, she said, Brother Royce, I, I don't want to come. I, I've never been to a funeral in my life, and I'm afraid. And I said, Judy, you got to come. I mean, for your sake, you got to come, for your family's sake. And I, I'll meet you at the funeral home before the service. I'll walk you through everything, and uh, we'll be there for you. And I remember thinking, my soul, here is an adult lady with three children, married, and she's never been to a funeral in life. We need to teach our, our people how to handle grief, how to deal with grief situation. And so this morning, I want us to look at this process of grief and see how we can better work our way through it. The book of Job is a dramatic poem and uh, has a lot of insights, but I want us to look at it in this area of management of grief and see how one man coped with this experience that is so common to all of us. I read the story a while ago about his life, and, and you remember he was a, it's a familiar story. He had great property, large family, 
greatly respected, said he was the greatest man in all the East, and then all the objects of value were taken away. He lost his possession through conquest and calamity. His children were killed when a storm hit the house they were eating in. And to add insult to injury, he, was, he lost his health. He had sores on his body. He was utterly alone. I want you to see, here's a man in acute loss, lost everything. And I want us to see how he coped with that experience. Some discernible stages that he went through are the same stages that most of us go through as we deal with grief in our life. Dr. Cooper Ross wrote a book called Dealing with Death, and she was a uh, did great research in this area. And she said most of us go through certain stages as we deal with grief experiences. And Job went through some of those very same experiences that, sh that she dealt with. You might want to just jot them down on the back of your bulletin because these are normal experiences. These are experiences that are okay for us to go through with. And, and if, if you know it's normal, sometimes it helps us as we're dealing with them. The first, first step, stage that she, uh, Job went through was his first reaction was that of numbed shock. Just numb shock. In chapter 2, verse 11, it said Job's three friends met together to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. And when they saw Job from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud and they tore their robes and they sprinkled dust on their heads and they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights and no one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. When they, when they saw Job, they, they just couldn't take it in because of, of, of how devastated he was. He was in a state of numb shock. His losses were so great that he could hardly take it in. And that's nearly everybody's reaction when they have a tremendous grief experience in their life. After pastoring in Athens, we graduated from seminary and I moved out to Vernon, Texas to pastor the Calvary Baptist Church in Vernon, Texas. I hadn't been there but a few months and one afternoon my phone rang and it was my church secretary who was in the next office. It was her adult da daughter. And she called to tell me that her dad, my church secretary's husband, a deacon in our church, had walked into a gas station to pay for gas in Paducah, Texas, about an hour down the road and had a massive heart attack and he collapsed and he died. And she was coming over and she and I were going to tell my church secretary that the husband that she kissed goodbye to that morning you would never see again in this lifetime. And I remember when we sat down with Carol there in the office and I told her that, she looked at me and she said, Brother Royce, I just can't believe it. And that's, that's normal. That's most of our normal reaction. When it begins to settle upon us how, how drastically our life has been altered. It's not uncommon for a person to be under the initial impact of something like a daze, kind of walking around as if in a dream. We're in a, a state of numbed awareness. And, and really that's merciful at first. But it doesn't last forever. And sooner or later, the awesome reality begins to dawn on us how utterly and dramatically our life has changed. And then the next stage that we see Job going through is that of utter hopelessness. Chapter 3, verse 1. It says, After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, may the day of my birth perish. In the night, it was said, a man child was born. Job, Job curses the day he was born. He said, if I could die immediately, that would suit me just fine. He said, I wish I've never been born. He said, stop the world. I want to get off. Anyone has experienced a profound loss in their life is familiar with that kind of a sentiment. When he begins to settle on us, how utterly our life has been altered. It appears to be no hope. There's an impulse to do what Job's wife told him to do, to disregard the whole experience as a total curse and just give up. That's what she told him in chapter 2, verse 9. His wife said to Job, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. But that's not the answer. One begins to realize that somehow they must go on. Amen. And so in the next stage, Job comes to terms with reality. In the third stage, he turns to the most appealing aspects, the memories of the past. We see that in chapter 29. In chapter 29, verse 3, Job says, Oh, how long for the months gone by, for the days when God watched over me. Job said, Oh, I wish it could be like it used to be. 
I wish it could be like, like it used to be. I wish it was like the good old days when I had my children and my possessions and my steam and my health and how good life used to be. And oftentimes at this place, this stage in the grieving process, there's also a sense of guilt. We should have been more grateful. We should have behaved differently. We shouldn't have done some cruel things that we did. This is a crucial moment in the grieving process because there's a temptation to want to turn from reality and to live in the past, to live in a world of fantasy. And to make that a way of life is tragic. A few years ago, my favorite aunt passed away in Tyler. She had been battling cancer. It wasn't unexpected. My mother called me and said they wanted me to hold the funeral. And so early that morning, I drove down to Tyler and I went to my uncle's and aunt's home there. And uh, the family was all there in the house and we visited together. And then I took my uncle and his daughter, my first cousin, Debbie, and we went back to the back bedroom and sat down and we talked about the service, some things they'd want me to say about, about my aunt. And, and, and after we talked about that a little bit, I talked about this stage in the grieving process with my uncle. I said, you know, you can't just sit down now. You can't just quit living. You've got to go forward. You've got to continue on. And, 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 and Aunt Rita would want you to do that. And he said, I know that, Roy. I said, I, I've got a friend whose wife died recently, and he goes to the cemetery every single day. He just seems like he can't get past this. And then the next stage we see Job moving to was that of anger and resentment. As Job reflected on his loss, he began to look for somebody to blame. It was intensified by what his, his three friends were doing to him. His three friends had it all figured out, and they were blaming Job for what happened. Look in chapter, or listen to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 7. They, they, they said to Job, these friends, Consider, Job, who being innocent has ever perished? Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. At the breath of God, they're destroyed. At the blast of His anger, they perish. They had it all figured out. They said, Job, once you were prosperous, that's because you were righteous. Now you're suffering. There must be sin in your life. They blamed Job for his troubles. So Job looked around and said, who can I blame? He blamed God. He said, God is not fair. We need to be careful here as, as friends that are walking beside those in grief. We need to be careful what we say. It's a mistake to try to give a simple explanation to a profound mystery. We need to learn that it is futile and unproductive to try to explain tragedy in some kind of a comprehensive way. Dr. John Claypool used to pastor in Fort Worth, but before that he was a pastor in Louisville, Kentucky. Large church there. His 10-year-old daughter, Laura, came down with leukemia. Dr. Claypool said in the last days of her life, I would go up to the hospital and I would stay all night with Laura. And Laura would look at me in her pain and say, Daddy, did you talk to Jesus? Daddy, what did Jesus say? I would go through those agonizing times with her. And then I'd come down in the morning, I'd, I'd run into some of my friends for church and some of them would put their arm around me and say, Well, John, it's just the will of God. And Claypool said, That didn't help at all. If anything, that made me angry. It's futile and unproductive to try to explain tragedy in some kind of a comprehensive way. The calamities of life are deeply mysterious, and the more we try to explain and fix the blame, the further we get from the truth. We must be so careful. When I was pastoring there in Vernon, Texas, my home pastor from Tyler, was like a father to my whole family, came to preach a revival at my brother-in-law's church. My brother-in-law, who's married to my twin sister, Joyce, was called to pass. I was in Vernon. They were called to pastor 30 miles down the road at First Baptist Crowell, Texas. And that August uh, summer, he came to preach a revival over there at Crowell. And, and one night, Carol and I went over to the revival. But the revival was over on Sunday night. 
And all the people were standing out there around First Baptist Church Crowell saying goodbye to Brother Gardner and visited like you do after church sometimes. And there's a main highway that runs from Crowell to uh, Kiwana, Texas there. And we don't know why, but, but my twin sister, the preacher's son, my, my nephew Brad, who would be six the next day, his birthday cake was already made. We don't know why, but he was playing with his little friends out there in front of the church where his daddy was pastor. And for some reason, he ran right across the highway and was killed right there in front of the church where his daddy was pastor. We got the call. Carol and I drove over there. We got there. We went into the little county hospital, Ford County Hospital. Place was packed. Everybody in the whole county was there. And I remember as we came into the hallway and started down the hallway, my twin sister came out of the hospital room, and there was Brother Gardner. And she grabbed a hold of Brother Gardner, and she said, Brother Gardner, why? Why? Brother Gardner said the wisest thing you could ever say. He said, Joyce, I don't know. I don't know. The calamities of life are deeply mysterious, and the more we try to explain and fix the blame, the further we get from the truth. You see, the basic issue in grief is not a rational explanation. What matters is the nature of life itself and the one who gives it. So Job went from shock to hopelessness to wanting to live in the past and to anger. And now in the climatic stage, Job, the one who was made, stands face to face with his master. And two things emerged out of that encounter that helped him move through his grief experiences and to hold it. First of all, he came to a no understanding of the past and a fresh vision of the future. You see, God called into question this justice, injustice approach. God said to Job, Job, what have you done to create all this? In chapter 38, God appears to Job out of a whirlwind. God says, it says, God answered Job out of the storm. It said, and Job, God said to Job, Job, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? God said, hold it just a minute, Job. What have you done to deserve this? What did you do to create this world? What did you do to create your possessions and your family and all those things? Do you think that, that you have them because of yourself? No, they're all gifts from me. He said, Job, the things that you're indignant about losing were never yours in the first place. They were just gifts. And that you ever had them was more than you deserved. And Job, gratitude and humility rather than resentment should characterize your handling of this experience. Dr. Claypool, whose little girl died of leukemia, tells about when he was a boy that World War II started. And one of his father's business associates was called to serve, and, and so he stored all of his possessions in their basement. His father allowed him to do that. And one of the things that were stored in his basement was an old green Bendix washing machine. And Claypool said, I was a boy, and my mother let me use and run and wash all the clothes in that green Bendix washing machine. It was, it was a, a joy to me to get to do that. Everything went fine until the war was over. One day, the, my father's business associate backed a trailer up to our basement and began to get, all, get his possession. Everything was going fine until he went to get my green Bendix washing machine. And I told him just what I thought about him getting my washing machine. Claypool said, my mother took me back in the bedroom and set me down and said, John, never was our washing machine one day. Only by gr- his goodness did he allow us to use it. Claypool said, as I stood beside my little girl there in the hospital, God began to speak to my heart, and I began to understand that Laura was a gift from him. And the fact that I ever had her for 11 days was only by his goodness and his grace. And gratitude began to fill my heart, and I was able to have her during that time. God, out of a whirlwind, reminded Job that all the treasures of the past are gifts beyond our deserving. And, and Job began to come to a new understanding of the past, that nothing really belonged to him. All of the things we have. How do you learn? How do you learn? How do I learn to handle grief? Number one, we have to realize that all of life is a gift. Our possessions, our loved ones, our children, our talents, our ability, our health, our careers, it's all a gift from God. And then the second thing is, Job came to a, an insight about the future. He came to, he came to have a, a fresh vision of the future. In chapter 42, 
The scripture says, Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things and no plan of yours can be thwarted. God made it clear to Job that he had not been defeated by the events of the past. That, that Job still had a future with God. You see, nobody moves out of the shadow of grief apart from some form of hope. Vance Heaven wrote a beautiful little book called Though I Walked Through the Valley when his wife died. In that book, Claypool says that people would come to me and say, I'm sorry that you've lost your wife. And, Cla and uh, uh, Vance Havner said that. I'm, they would say to Vance Havner, I'm sorry that you've lost your wife. And Havner would say, you know, I don't think I've lost something when I know where it is. The essence of despair is relating God solely to the past. We need to remember that the God who gave us good gifts in the past is still alive to give us meaning and purpose for our life in the future. That's how we learn to handle grief. You see, part of the problem of grieving is often idolatry. We want to make gods of certain people and objects and refuse to give them up or to receive other gifts in the future. Another part of the problem is not trusting the creativity of God enough to believe that He can give us new things that will bring meaning and joy to our lives. Romans chapter 8 said all things work together for good. It doesn't mean all things are good. There's a lot of things that happen that aren't good. But God says, even out of those things that aren't good, I can bring good at them for those that love the Lord. So in the last chapter, we see Job moving from resentment to gratitude. In chapter 42, verse 10, it said, After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again, gave him twice as much as he had before. And the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the, than, the, the, than the first. Now it doesn't mean that God got that Job got back the same children or possessions because he didn't. But what he did get back was a deepened and enlarged capacity for life. And this can happen to a person as a result of the grieving process. But it's not automatic. It can embitter a person forever. Harden and isolate them. But if we're willing... This process of grief can deepen and widen our ability to participate in life. It can make us more grateful for the gifts we've been given. More sensitive to the whole mysterious process of life. And more trusting in our adventure with God. So how do we learn how to handle grief? Number one, life is a gift. Say that with me. Life is a gift. Number two is... The God that made life meaningful in the past is still alive to make life meaningful in the future. Would you stand with me for prayer? Maybe you're here today and you've never accepted the gift of eternal life. You've never given your heart to the Lord. He wants to come into your life. He wants to give you eternal life. Next Sunday morning, we're going to baptize eight that have given their heart to the Lord. But there's others here today that need to come and give their heart to the Lord. Maybe you've been thinking about it. You've been listening. Holy Spirit's been speaking to your heart. You need to come and say, I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to accept the gift of eternal life. Maybe you've been coming to this church. You need to come and and join with us. Move your membership here. Become a part of our church family here. Maybe you've been away from the Lord. You've been out there in a the far field. God's been speaking to your heart. Through, maybe through the youth program. Maybe through your children. Maybe through the music. Whatever ever how God's been speaking to you. He's speaking to you. He's drawing you to come back to Him. Wouldn't you come back to Him and recommit your life? And do what God wants you to do. Pray for the service. Pray for people to do what God wants them to do. Our musicians are going to sing a song of decision. I'll be here at the front to pray with you. Would you come right now to Jesus? Yeah. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. Hearing your love, hearing your love, no place I would rather be, no place I would rather be, no place I would rather be, hearing your love, hearing your love, hearing your love, hearing your love, Oh, oh, oh.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. Let me uh, let me just mention a couple of announcements, and then we'll take our uh, our offering. Uh, if you got your bulletin, take it out. Uh, see you in the polls coming up. And you did know this is a great opportunity to uh, support our youth, and uh, and we'll be our young people will be talking more about that too. Also, uh, notice the the uh, prison ministry uh, October the 19th to the 22nd. Next Sunday morning, we uh, we have I think uh, nine candidates to be baptized for a great baptismal service. We'll have a regular service here, and uh, and then we'll uh, go over a course to baptize, and we have nine to be baptized. If you would like to be baptized, you've already given your heart to the Lord. If you haven't been baptized, and you'd like to do that, please call me. My phone number is in the bulletin, or you can talk to me after church today. We could still uh, talk with you about baptism next Sunday morning uh, uh, at 9:45. Now. All of our baptismal candidates, if you're going to be baptized, Bill and I want to meet with you next Sunday morning at the beginning of Sunday school, 945, over at, at the chapel. Can we call it the chapel? Is that what we call it? The chapel? We want to meet with you at 945 for about five or ten minutes, okay? But then we'll baptize at the end of the worship service at this time, okay? But we want to meet with all of our baptismal candidates, just kind of walk through everything, make sure we're on the same page. So be sure to bring a change of clothes and a, uh, and a towel, too, for that. Now, mark uh, October the 8th on your calendar. That's three weeks from now. We're going to have a great day that day. We're going to have a, a band called the Little Rover Bible. They're a country gospel band. They're going to have the whole service that day. Uh, it's going to be a great concert. They've been singing with me for almost 20 years all over North Texas. They are wonderful. They're so talented. They're almost as good as this group back here. Now, this group is really good, though. <laughs> but uh, they're good. Then we're going to have dinner here at the church afterwards, and so it's a great opportunity for you to invite somebody with people that you've been trying to get to come to church that maybe haven't gone in a long time. Invite them to come and to hear that concert. Tell them the preacher's not going to preach. That'll, that'll be a plus for them, right? And uh, we're going to have a concert. We're going to have dinner. And uh, it's a great opportunity. Mark it on your calendar, too. There is a, uh, a staff meeting today with our staff and deacons after the church today. And also, Tim said that, uh, Tim, where's Tim? Tim, uh, the homeless ministry, next Sunday, right? Next Sunday, Tim said you'd know what we're, what we're talking about for that, too, okay? Uh, let's see, and remember our Wednesday night? We have a good group on Wednesday night. We have fellowship at 6.30, and we have classes for everybody at 7 o'clock. We invite you on Wednesday night to come be with us for that, too. We will be having a brief business meeting. We're going to dismiss in a few minutes after the service. And then we'll call back just for a brief business meeting too. So if our ushers would come forward and we'll take our morning offering. Jesus said in Matthew, Woe to you teachers of the law, Pharisees, you hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Jesus said, we should practice justice and mercy and faithfulness, but also we should give our tithe to the Lord. Jim, would you lead us in prayer, please? Father, we thank you this morning that you have met with us. And Father, we pray that we indeed met with you so that there is reciprocity between us. Father, bless the offering to the glory of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
today giving her heart to the Lord. She uh, in youth with Bill. This morning she invited uh, the Lord to come into her life. Hallelujah. <laughs> Brother Tristan was saved last Sunday morning. So Hallelujah! Uh, Amen. Uh, Amen. Amen. So you want to welcome in our church. Let it be known by saying a hearty amen. 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 We're going to stand here at the front while we sing the last song. We have one more. Is that right? We do. Okay. Good. Thank you. Everybody to join hands. Yeah. We've got a great song. Yeah. Let's join hands. Let's hold hands together. Thank you all so much, man. And oh, it's an honor to be here. We'll be this. We'll be this. Thank you. 